Hi everyone, welcome to the Google Podcast. I am your host, Rob Watson. Got another amazing guest lined up for you today. But before I do that, as always, every few weeks, I sit down with amazing people who are doing really good in the world. You only have to look at the news and get the impression of the way everything is in the world that I can feel like it's doom and gloom. But I believe there's so much good happening in the world. We only have to turn our attention to that. And when we do turn our attention to the good, it actually empowers us and makes us feel that we can be part of the solutions out there. I believe there's an opportunity for all of us to play a role in creating a better world, creating a better world for ourselves, for our communities. And that ties in really well with today's guest, who is Steffi Brower, who is the founder of Brighter Green Futures. And part of their mission is to think that it's imperative that we build communities where people can truly thrive and live in harmony with the planet. And that's something that her company does. I was fortunate to go down and visit her and what she does a few weeks ago. And it's truly inspiring to see. She's got a very rich experience in the field, having been part of community build, eco build, setting them up and going back into the noughties back then. So um, really inspiring. I really enjoyed this episode. I got really inspired by some of the things she said imagine how my own future might unfold i've spoken at length on this podcast about how i feel like we need to get back to our roots we need to live more um in community it feels like the way we are in this western world we feel quite disconnected and um, so it was a real pleasure to be able to speak with steffi and um, before i do get into this episode i just want to thank those who do f- um, support me on my patreon page i really appreciate that for the price of less than a cup of coffee each month you can help support me and what i do and also for anyone who is listening to this and wants to check out Positive News, I have an exclusive offer with them. If you put in Do Good 20 at checkout, you'll get 20% off a year subscription. This uh, this podcast is all about uh, good news, positive news. So it's a great team to tie it with. And I don't ever support or promote anyone, which is something that I was fully behind. I don't receive a penny from them. I just want to support them because I believe they're doing good. Okay, without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Steffi. All right, yeah, firstly, Steffi, I really appreciate you taking the time with me today to speak on my podcast. I've been really interested in having someone come on the show from a, uh, someone who's been part of communities, create communities, eco communities. Um, I think it'd be really good for the audience to help inspire them, particularly with the way the past few years have unfolded. I think people are yearning for more connection, more con- connection with people, connection with the earth, and maybe getting back to our roots. Um, but yeah, firstly, I appreciate you speaking with me today. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Welcome. Pleased to be able to contribute to your lovely podcast. I oh, know you're welcome. Um, so I had the pleasure of meeting you a few weeks ago um, down in Bristol to get a bit of a tour of um, the community that you're currently, new community that you're creating, uh, Water Lilies, um, but then also see your past projects as well. Um, but maybe before we get into them, maybe just can we just give the listeners a little bit of an overview, a bit of a background uh, to yourself? That would be great. Uh, yeah, so my name is Steffi Brower. Um, I yeah, I came to the UK from Germany in a long time ago, and I uh, moved to Bristol and built a home in a community. I had a background. Um, my I worked as a sustainable energy consultants consultant on on eco buildings and renewable energy projects, and so um, I joined this community um, to basically, um, you know, put, put my hands on um, what I was doing at work. And it was amazing on, on a shoestring, lived in a caravan with a baby um, and built a beautiful house on a shoestring. And it really was life-changing, A, the process of doing it and then living in such a great supportive community, you know, bringing the children up there. Um, so I eventually set up the company um, because I thought we need to build more houses like this for the planet and and for the people. So I understand that first one as well. It was it was on Grand Designs, wasn't it? And there was a is it how big was the collective of people that came together? Yeah, there are forty homes in the first community. Um, yeah, the the initial phase was twenty self built houses. The first phase, and then. There were six bungalows in the middle. They were so finished. And the last phase was the conversion of the old office block into a community hub, um, three workshops for social enterprises and for apartments. Exciting. Um, so you touched on that. They're saying that you built this house on a shoestring um, with a baby. You know, I often, when I'm watching Grand Designs, there's loads of people who are either just expecting a baby and they're living in a caravan 
Um, and I think it probably maybe puts off a chunk of people, but then how was that actual experience? Um, yeah, well, actually, um, the baby wasn't planned, but actually it ended up being perfect because, you know, I was pregnant, so I actually, we actually needed a house, <laughs> didn't really need a house before. Um, and also, actually, I really loved building a house, you know, like designing the house. And then I think we started building um just before Isham, just after Isham was born, actually. And the other mummies were going to cafes and I've never been one for mummy co- coffee mornings. Um, I've always, my kids have always kind of evolved around what I was doing. I always saw myself a bit more like sort of the African mummy with the baby on the back. And that's what it was like. We were going to build as much as and Isham was really, well, he's still really, he's 19 now, but he's still really smiley. And um, yeah, he charmed everyone. And they didn't really see many women. They didn't see any babies. So we got, we became quite famous. And um, I think we usually got the best prices as well, because everybody was, you know, wanted to help us get into the house. Um, yeah. So it was actually um, a really, enjoyable journey and I think for Isham it was also really exciting you know to see the diggers from his baby bouncer in the in the caravan um there was always something going on yeah yeah it would be exciting it's something that we've spoken about for quite a few years now and that's one of the reasons like I'm keen to speak to you but I also speak to plenty of other friends as well who are really open to being part of a community setting up. So it's nice to speak to someone who's gone through the process and it obviously hasn't put you off because you've done it a second time and now you're doing it a third time. Each time it seems to be getting bigger. Um, That's right. <laughs> um, so uh, so all them them first ones, I understand they were all different. Um, they all they are kind of look like a set, but they're all individual as well, aren't they? Like they all work together. Um, but... Yeah, in the first project, we each designed our own home. So every house is completely unique. Um, what if we've done more with the writing features projects, we've it's we've kind of harmonized it a little bit in that um, it, even though every house is different. So I'll show you um, this is water lilies, what we're building now. Um, it's 21 houses and 12 apartments around a garden square with the cars parked on the ground. So every house has got different windows and in the back they're even more different because they have different sizes and different shapes, but um, they're all designed by the same architect and every customer is sitting down with the architect to design their bespoke home. But the architect also makes sure that the houses work very well together. So it's still um, cohesive. I think the other, the yard where I built my first house, it was amazing to do. It's an amazing scheme um you know was very pioneering but we also learned some lessons which we were able to integrate now into what we do in Brighton Features and one of those was um a bit more coherence between the houses um but yeah I think I still everyone wants to live in the yard in Bristol you know it's still a, a great project in that way and certainly not boring you know, certainly yeah. not like one of those new housing estates where every house looks exactly the same. People don't look, uh, we're not all exactly the same, you know, we all shine in our individuality. Yeah. So I think it's important that the houses reflect that. Yeah, this definitely feels like, I feel I feel like within everyone, everyone's got the potential to build their own home. We've all got it. And I think that's what is kind of in our DNA for thousands of years is, is building homes of some sort within us and and um i think when you some of the people i get inspired about particularly yourself but others i watch people who uh they build a house by watching youtube clips like how to do each phase of it and there's a way you know where there's a will there's a way um and if you've got enough perseverance and time and, and i think what was inspiring for your first one you said you did it on a shoestring budget because i think some people might think well i can never afford that um I know it's probably evolved somewhat. Do you think people can still do it on a shoestring now with the way things are in 2021? Well, house prices and material prices have gone up, so there's no denying that. But building a house 
should always be cheaper than buying the equivalent house um, because the, you know you're cutting out the developer profit. Uh, you can do it DIY, so you don't pay for that labor. Anything that you do DIY, you can you know pay your friends and and if you've got friends who work in the trade and and pay mates rates. Um, so yeah, if you get it right, your house should be more affordable than if you buy one. Yeah, and like you that said, that doesn't like mean it. you know that that doesn't mean. I mean, some people come to us and want to get a house for a hundred k, and we can't do that because we're still you know constrained by the market um, in the UK and and the locations. Um, but it's it feeds, it helps. Yeah. yeah. And like you said as well, you get to put your own stamp on it. Um, it's an opportunity to be creative for the space. But what I do like about your recent one, the one that you just showed the pictures for, and I'll share some pictures as well for those who are listening on audio, is it may be, in some ways, it feels like it probably makes it more attainable and more accessible for some people. Rather than thinking, I need to find a plot of land, I need to work with the architect from scratch, I need to put all the planning in. You've done all that element, but people then get to put their own stamp on how the layout works. Because I actually found when I came to see it, it actually looks better with all the windows in different spaces and doors and different shapes on the front. It adds to it. I think if they were all the same, same formula, it would feel a bit, you know, yeah, a bit samey. So I think it adds to it. Yeah, definitely. I don't know. There's a, that picture of Bristol that, you know, is in most um, brochures that advertise Bristol and it's it's by the docks with all the houses in the different colours and everything different. Same with medieval towns. It's all hickety pickety and they are beautiful. Yeah, same. I mean, well, <laughs> maybe that's a, that's a question of taste, but, um, you know, if you look at places where everybody wears the school, same uniform, like school uniform or military uniform, do you like that? Or, or do you think people are more beautiful when they pick something, you know, that they feel comfortable in, that they feel is their own expression? I mean, I'm quite glad we don't all have to have <laughs> the same haircut or wear the same glasses or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So you're originally from Germany. What's it like in terms of Germany for people, self-builds, eco-communities? Because I understand um, that the Tamara community in Portugal was actually originally set up by a bunch of people from Germany, leaving Germany to move to Portugal. So I'm interested to know, is it a bit of a thriving space for that? Uh, there was a big um, self-built market in Germany because of the way the policy works. So half of the um, land that is released for building is set aside for self-built. Um, so a lot of people uh, will build their own homes, um, but not so much in terms of eco-housing communities and the community focus that also is, is quite rare in Germany. How have you found the community aspect of it in terms of throughout, it's almost two decades now um, of living in this way. How have you found that? Oh, yeah, I I absolutely love it. Um, you have to understand how to do community. So it's a bit like an intimate relationship. You know, if you've got a good one, it's great. And if you quarreling all the time it's not you better off for that one so um we have I mean, it's been really useful that i've lived in so many different communities and my friend large who helped set up the company and the community strategy as well um to really think through um you know what can go wrong in community and why does it go wrong and therefore how do we need to do it so it works very well so we've got a method that we use and um so far it's been yeah I think it's been a real success so if someone's listening to this and they're thinking um I'd love to develop my own community or be part of one what what are some of the things that they shouldn't do what what is like the mistakes that people tend to do from the off yeah that's a really good question so in terms of building a community right you're asking yeah from either from from the ground up or coming together Mm. doing it as a collective and finding the land and everything Yeah, so I think the start, usually what happens, people get together and say, oh, let's all build a great community together and everyone's really excited. 
Um, and then they go like, oh, yeah, and we'll have allotments and we'll have renewable energy and we'll have a community hub and we'll build the houses really well and with, you know, lots of straw bale and lovely materials. And then, um, then there's a lot of work to do. They went, they went, they went basically no hierarchy often, you know, and a lot of autonomy. And what's interesting, if you don't have the hierarchy, there's a lot of work to do. Um, the sad thing is that somebody will step into the power vacuum to take the lead. And it's not necessarily the person, it's not somebody who's democratically elected. Um, it's not necessarily the right person. And then some decisions have to be made because you always have to, you know, it's always about if you have something extra, you have to pay for it. And then these decisions need to make, and there's no decision-making process in place. And then people try to make the decisions and someone gets upset. You know, a lot of people tend to get upset because they can't have what they want, or they get upset because the direction goes somewhere yet, somewhere else where decisions are made um, to feed a certain part of the group but not the other part of the group and because there hasn't been a decision making process that everybody's bought into people get upset so re really sadly you know usually lovely people getting together and there's just so few communities that actually get built a lot of them fail very early on a lot of them drink get together and drink tea for nine years and then give up and a very few make it happen like the yard where I was and Fintuan I think you mentioned to me before there's a few handful of communities that actually made it work and most of them will tell you that the process was quite painful along the way including in the yard um, and so I would say it's really important from the set out to have um clear leadership and that's kind of what we do in the Brighton Futures model we take leadership and we ask everybody what they want so when people register their interest in our form um, we ask them what's most important to them so we design the scheme around what a lot of people want but we know that's not for everyone when we go out we say have a look if this is for you so the core decisions are already made and then we tweak everything with with the customers but also uh, you know, as part of the package, they are paying the Bright Green Features team for the work, for taking the leadership. And it's actually usually cheaper that way because we've got the right expertise to do it. That's the other thing with communities. It can get very expensive in, in building if you make mistakes. Um, so the big risk is already taken away. And then the other thing we do, which is really important, is to build a culture of how you're working with each other. So what we have, like our founding pillars are solution focused and the no, and yeah, basically a solu solution focused and a, a sort of no blame culture. Um, so we are, when we when anyone brings the problem, they also bring their solution. And we have a trusted leadership principle where whoever is taking leadership, so Brighton Futures is taking the overall leadership of the project. But sometimes our customers will step up and say become a, a garden coordinator or you know take leadership of, of specific roles. Then the trusted leader is trusted um, to take the lead. Their responsibility is to, to listen um, and to serve the group and the benefit of all and not to govern and to listen to all the voices, including the minority voices, and then to make a decision that they think is best for everyone. And then the group has to respect that decision. So you can move forward, you don't have to wait because in the building project, there are many decisions to be made every day. And that's another thing that happens in the community. Like often there's a consensus process to make decisions and every decision takes a long time to reach and you can't deliver a building project like that because you have to work a lot quicker. Um, yeah, so I think I would say set up that leadership culture, build, build that culture of solution focused and loving and respectful relating um, and draw the people in who are really up for that. You don't want you know, to have someone in the group who, who just sort of complains and makes things difficult. So that's really important that that sort of you want people who are 
were actually cooperatively working to deliver the project. And that's really lovely about Water Lilies. It's our customers are so amazing because you know things there's there's always delays and things that go wrong and it's really amazing when you just actually you're looking at how can we actually make this work and I love the Brighton Futures everyone in the Brighton Futures team is so devoted to serving the customers and delivering a great project and most of the contractors as well so it's just beautiful to actually I feel like I've just become this platform for people who want to do something better you know deliver a great project and the customers who want to live better so they you know they can be live more purposeful lives and support themselves and it's just great to build this platform and say who's in and then see it just you know taking its, its own momentum yeah i reckon all those people is it 33 different um homes is it in total at the yeah well and yeah. I reckon they're all they're so excited about moving in. And when, when do they actually move in? Uh, well, they so they're fitting, they're doing their own fit out. Um, the people who've got the houses, uh, so it depends when they finish. Like the first people have been in for a couple of months now doing their fit outs. So I imagine the first people uh, might move in by the end of the year, and then I would think that by next summer most people will have moved in. And there'll be a few people who, who take their time and um, do it more slowly. So then just to be clear for the, the audience, so they basically, you build the development, you create the shell for it, you put all the heating in place and everything is all set up. And then they come in and basically put in the kitchen, the bathroom. Is that how it works? Uh, yes, nearly. So for the houses, we built the shell so... The outside um, will be completely finished, but we actually we bring the services into the house, but the internal walls um, are not there at all. So actually, we wanted to enable as, as much self-build as possible. So what you can then do when you come into a house, you go like, actually, when, I'm, when you're standing in it, I want to move this wall a little bit this way, like actually in this room make the bedroom a bit bigger and and the bathroom a bit smaller and you know so you can make these little tweaks being in the in the space still and yeah then people they do do their bathrooms their all their internal walls um their heating systems um their kitchens their floors their painting and decorating and their internal doors so you can do some really unique things with beautiful carpentry solutions and, and things that you know would just wouldn't be possible if you bought in your home and then the, for the apartments uh, you cannot get a separate mortgage so we had to take them to completion um, so people could get a mortgage so what we're doing there is that we each everyone had a design session and we are building their bespoke home for them instead great mm-hmm um, and it's quite an unusual site, isn't it? So I think it's probably worth touching on the sites. How tricky is it f- to find plots to to do these um, to do these builds? Um, well, everybody always says it's so hard to find the land, but it's just like you know we have access to the same plots as any other property developer. Um, yeah, I mean. You, I think you want to have a bit of imagination when you look at a, at a plot of land and see the potential. Um, because, yeah, like the, the Waterloo side was in a deprived area of Bristol. It's on a slope. Um, it had a reservoir on it and people weren't really looking at it. And I, I looked at it. I was like, wow, it's right next to w- Woodland. It's got views over the Severn Estuary. You're really quickly in Bristol. You're, you know, you're by, by the downs in 10 minutes. There's hardly ever any traffic. I was like, this is going to be a great place to live as a community. Um, and I, I like the slope because it allows us to do really interesting designs. So, you know, sometimes the sites where nobody is looking at are the best ones. The sites are everyone wants in desirable areas. Yeah, you are competing with a lot of people and it can be quite 
difficult and 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 expensive and tricky to make work but it's good to just keep an eye out um and especially once you're building in community you're looking at the bigger sites you're not just looking for one off plot which is probably even harder to find um so yeah i have a bit of a man imagination and to see the potential i think that would be my recommendation where is there particular websites that people can go on to or resources to besides just going on right move or is it is that where you're going to go you're going to go on right move or zoopla to find these spaces or is there anything and there's is there a website called diggers and dreamers um um that i check out occasionally which i think is more for people wanting to come together i'm not sure if it's got plots on yeah there is estate gazettes which lists commercial sites and there are agents every everywhere are commercial property agents um you know a lot of plots don't get put on right move or in the open market and um the agents just contact the people they know so you can get in touch with agents and ask them to send you what what they've got as well mm. um, but yeah i mean i think if you do it yourself if you do it in a group you need to kind of get the group organization right first and you know or you know if you go with a provider like brighton features then the great thing is that's all all the difficult thing when, when we, i when i came up with the idea of brighton features i thought how can we make the safe self build journey um better and you know more exciting less stressful and get a better outcome you know, and it was clear to me, like, you don't want to just self build on your own, you want to self build in community because you're helping each other. And because you then end up with a great neighborhood, not just with your dream home, but also with your dream neighborhood and with really lovely people. Um, and I also then that and then there are all these aspects of getting planning permission can be really stressful, knowing how to design a really comfortable net zero carbon home it, there's a lot to learn I mean I studied all of this at university and I worked in consultancy for a long time um, and then other people really know how to build so in community is good because you're bringing all these skills together and if you're going with a provider like Brighton Features who's got that in-house expertise of the things that are really difficult to learn and the things that you need to learn are taught we teach them in workshops um, you know then it makes the whole thing a lot more pleasant and takes the edge off but especially that's why you know our customers are fitting out because the really bespoke um interesting designs that most of them those decisions are made in the fit out in the detail you know and some of it is about where you position the windows but again we let our customers decide all of that so yeah they get just a much better outcome and a, a smoother ride it's still an adventure obviously because every self build is um but yeah and you they get to influence also how their neighborhood looks not just their house yeah just touching on that um the neighborhood aspect the community aspect is something mm -hmm. that i find the most appealing um because you understand you've got a community space um which is part of um of, of water lilies and i've gone to visit a few communities one uh, lancaster co-housing and we did a nice tour for the day and we saw the actual community space, you know, a beautiful kitchen, big open plan, all the kids are running around playing together and mm -hmm. you know, parents or old people are just all, you know, breaking bread together and chatting away. And for me, it just, when I see that, it warms my heart. And I think I mentioned it to you when we mm -hmm. went, I saw you in Bristol. It's like what I used to love when I was young is I used to love it when my friends would just come and knock on the door and say, you're coming out mm -hmm. to play. And um, and now, you know, the thought of anyone just knocking on saying, you know, kind of come in. I just like the idea that it's just nice and open, nice and free. You've always got a space to go to, um, to hang out, to see people. But on the other side is, I always love the bit that you've all got your self-contained home. If you don't want to come out for a few days because you're not feeling too well or you're just not in the mood for it, then it can completely be that space as well. How have you actually found that element where you've got a space to be? Yeah, exactly. I mean, some people are like, oh, I wouldn't want to live in a community because, you know, I don't want to I like my privacy. But actually, um, 
I find you get you can have more privacy and you can have more community and you can have whatever you want at any point in time. So what we had, we you know, in our community, we know who's got an open door policy and who doesn't. So the kids will kind of know which houses they can go in and out and which not. And some people are like, well, if my door is, you know, it's a little bit open, everyone's welcome to come in. If it's my front door is shut, don't come in. Um, so you sort of know what people want and you get to know your neighbours. And, and then for me, you know, a lot of my time with my kids, I, I've been parenting on my own and I get so much privacy because if I want to be alone, I can just shut my door and the kids have got so many people they can hang out with and so many kids they can be with. So it's really special. The houses are better, sound insulated, uh, so you get more quiet. And also what we did in Water Lilies, everybody's got a small private garden and then a big community garden. So everybody has got a, a quiet private space if they want privacy outdoor as well as indoor, obviously. Uh, if you are really noise sensitive, you can have ex put extra insulate acoustic insulation into your home. Or if you want to make loads of noise, um, you know, some people have a music studio and they just insulate it acoustically so not to disturb the neighbours. You know, people talk to each other, they're really friendly. Um, so they can also talk to each other and let their needs be known. There's a community hub. So if you want to hang out with people, there's somewhere to go. Um, also in the garden, we'll divide different spaces to like a more meditation, quiet area and a more sort of playful area. So then there's different um, places to be. And yeah, so I think you, I always go into things with, I'm always trying to design it so you can have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> and of course, it's not possible with everything, but yeah, quite often it is and definitely is possible with the whole privacy community um, debate. Yeah. It sounds like I'm getting so excited for you and everyone who's going to be moving in there, but I'm thinking for my own future as well, because I remember... Um, but one thing, it reminds me of a bit as my nan and granddad when they were growing up. They said everyone would just be in the neighbourhood, would just be in and out of everyone's house. No one locked the door. It was kind of just, that's just the way it was. And for whatever reason, it's no, it's nothing like that anymore. What, what, do, you, what do you think has contributed to this disconnection in society? Do you think it's just the fact that there's more people now or... I don't know. Maybe I'll find out what you think. Well, I think if you live on, you know, nearly everyone lives on a road. So, you know, when I go out of, of our community right onto the road here and there's cars, I don't want to stop and, and chat to my neighbours because it's not a pleasant space. And then there's just so many people that you don't know everyone. So you lock your door because it's not safe because you think you'll get burgled. But if you're in a small community, we always had our back door open and, you know, it's very overlooked with the shared garden. We lock it at night, but, uh, you know, and it's it's in, in Bristol. It's not like, um, you know, a particularly sort of suburban wealthy area. <laughs> um, but, yeah, then people go out because, you know, everyone like in these communities, everybody knows everyone. Um, and and so. You feel, you feel safe you and what's great also you look out for each other so you kind of yeah because you know a lot of people I would say my former self as well don't ask for help when they need it and if nobody knows what's going on for you a lot of people are very lonely with their problems and don't resolve them um, but if you're living in a community um, people look out for each other and, you know, someone turns up if something's going on and asks if you want to talk about it or says, can I just look after your kids <laughs> tonight so you got some space or and something of that and vice versa. And, you know, that's really special. And I think we've also got a big customer group of people in their 50s or 60s who are thinking of, you know, where where do they want to live for the last, for the, you know, for the, but you know what, what? How would they finally want to live in their in their dream home? And 
not getting shafted off to some old people's home, but to be somewhere where you can live for the rest of your life and and you know build your friendships um, and have them last and build a house where you know you'll be able to move around even when your legs don't want to do it anymore. So it's it's nice to build communities for all ages where everyone's looked after and you know where where the toddlers um, can pl play with people of all ages and the young people have the community elders to guide them and inspire them and I really I really love to see that and it is it's true what you said Rob it's like what we used to have they say it takes a village to bring up a child doesn't it yeah and and that those kind of old family structures but to say they don't it doesn't have to be around the blood network it doesn't have to be around families anymore it can be we also have three generations um, in some of our communities but if it's not like that I mean it's amazing for me coming from Germany my family is all in Germany but I feel like I've just got this massive family living right around me from people from all over the world so that's really exciting yeah it does seem very exciting and one thing um but well, one thing triggered something then I remember like I always love the idea of being that idea of having all the generations, you know, the elders in the community, not just ship them off to old folks homes when they've kind of, people think they've left, you know, society thinks they've not got a purpose anymore. It's like, no, there's so much value and wisdom to be shared, but right the way across. And there was a show, I think on channel four a few years ago, and it put little children like two, I think, no, I think they were about maybe five, six, seven, eight year olds. And they put them in this old person's home with, um, but people who were like in the nineties and they followed them. They basically paired them up. They paired a youngster up with an elder and they followed them for about six months and then see them every week. And the transformation in the older people during that time, like it wasn't just in terms of like they were li alive, more happiness, but they even did some tests on them and they were healthier as well. Like it gave them some mm. vitality back. Um, mm. And I think, I don't know whether I was, I, I might be wrong with the statistic, but I heard someone saying that if you're living in community, or in this way, in this co-housing spaces, like something like your life expectancy is increases vastly because you're part of that. You're part of something. You, you know, loneliness. I think did he say like loneliness is as bad as, as smoking for your health, um, if not worse. And I think yeah. people have become so lonely the past couple of years, being locked indoors just with a TV screen to give them the, the information and. Um, so yeah, I do. I think the health and well-being aspect is another big thing for it, and you can. Ju it just comes through. Like you're telling us how it is, and you know you can see how excited and happy it makes you. That just naturally transpires to a healthier, longer life, um, mm. living as as part of a collective. Yeah, there was a study. They looked. They found these small communities all around the world where people were just living a lot longer and died of old age rather than disease. And they were studying what the parallel was um, in these communities. And it was, as he's saying, it, it, one is nutrition, so un, fruit that isn't very processed. And the other one is, is community. People felt like re valued and respected and like they, they were contributing. And, and yeah, so, and it's actually, there are some well-being scales, various ones from the NHS, and they are, it's all about, um, it's all really about community. People feel well if they feel, feel part of something um, and if they have people around them who support them and they, if they are feeling, if they are contributing to that. And it's really forgotten. Yeah, loneliness, I think it's not just the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, it, it's been a, increasingly a, a problem that has been growing a lot, um, especially in the first word. So it's nice to go, actually, what we could do here is we can use all the modern technology to build really net zero carbon, very comfortable homes that we couldn't have built before. Um, but they look beautiful like old homes. <laughs> and we can bring that old village feel back into these communities. Um, and hopefully do it without the, you know, without the old poli family politics and family hierarchies, but, you know, with valuing everyone um, 
everyone where they at. And yeah, I think with the with the grandparent thing, I just remember like when we moved when I was six years old, we moved um close to my grandparents and I could walk to their house. It's just I find, it's not just the grandparents who you know just start blossoming when they were little kids. But it's definitely in my, in my personal experience also just amazing for the children. Yeah. I often hear stories like um, grandparents get to right the wrongs that they did with their own children, with their grandchildren as well. It's like they, uh, <laughs> they've learned from the mistakes so they can um, impart all the good stuff. So, yeah, of course, it's important for them to spend um, um, time around them. It feels to me like what's going on now with what you've done, that you set up first one, the yard, back in the noughties, um, was it 19 years ago, um, a community-based initiative and then the second one this one now you're doing it it's a, the structure's kind of changed it's you know from your perspective like your business is is creating this but it's very much got the community aspect to it do you feel for things to really change it has to be from the ground up it has to be um community driven rather than thinking that the the governmental structures or the ha- the house building um big massive house builders in the uk are gonna are gonna do this because for me all the stuff that you're talking about with the community aspect and all the, the benefits of it. When a big corporation is looking at this, generally they're just looking at, well, how much money can we make? How many houses can we fit in this space? We'll choose whatever the quickest, cheapest material there is that, or within the guidelines, not necessarily thinking, how can we build neighborhoods and get people connected like it used to be? Uh, yeah, interested. Do you think, do you think there's, I know you, you got your company and hopefully at some point you'll be building big sites um like like potentially what might be out there but yeah be good to get your thoughts i think it's never any particular group of society that can make the change you know it's easy to say oh the politicians have to sort it out or the companies have to sort it out i think you always start with yourself you know i do anyway i'm like what can i actually do i can't just keep sitting here and complaining housing isn't built right you know I, I did it for long enough and then I was like look I've got to do something about it so I set up Brighton Beaches um, so I think it, it needs collective action there are always going to be people who are lagging behind who are not taking responsibility to doing it and they're all everybody will always find an excuse you know the big volume house builders will say you know we can't do it because we are responsible to our shareholders and they want and and to produce the maximum profit for them. Um, the politicians might say we can't do it because you know we lose the next, next election if we do it. Um, and people might say, oh, I can't do anything because you know the policies are not there. So unless we say there must be a way, <laughs> then um, nothing's going to change. So, you know, I think. This, what we are doing is really important because we're showing that it can be done. And we are saying we are going beyond net zero carbon. So we want to shift the housing market. And I, you know, we cannot, we're too small to build loads of houses, but the market can shift because, you know, if um, people stop buying um, bad housing, if people become aware and they don't want to buy kind of borrowed type houses, boxes anymore. Um, then those companies have to change. And if people are increasingly going to buy from companies that needs that have gone net zero carbon, um, then companies will have to change. And again, it would be easier for policymakers to change things when they can see actually it can be done. If we change the policies, then the other companies will have to follow suit. Um, so, you know, every voice counts and we need... We need a policy solutions. We need pioneering companies are doing something and we need people who are going on the street and writing to the politicians um, saying we don't want this anymore and people who demand better housing and who are not going to just put up with, you know, the bad quality, monotonous housing that they're presented with. I mean, I just think it's not fair. It's not good enough. And the more people who demand that, the easier it becomes for companies like us or the more people who get together as a community and build housing 
it's 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 a slow process but at some point it gets momentum and sometimes then shifts things tip and something really big changes and we were nearly there i mean we were supposed to have all new houses at net zero carbon in 2016 um there was there was a policy in place and it got scrapped unfortunately um, but there's a lot of momentum now with extinction rebellion and and a lot of so many people are talking about um that we need to do something in climate change about climate change it feels like the whole world is waking up so of course when you look at the science it's not enough and it can be very depressing but for me having worked in the field for over 20 years it's very different the narrative and then the co global consciousness is very different to 20 years ago so a lot is happening as well on that like you know when you're saying about it has to be people doing stuff it makes me think of that quote by gandhi you know be the change you want to see in the world and um, we can't sit around and wait for others to try and fix stuff we have to take self-responsibility for our life our actions to help the people around us that's the whole thing with this podcast that my aim is to empower people to become better versions of themselves to live more meaningful lives and i think what you're doing is it's exactly that um and Around the, um, you know, the policy stuff, I know, I think um, right now, is it that COP, as we're speaking now, um, that COP26 is is happening. Um, for me, I feel like um, I'm glad that everyone's speaking more about this, this and we want to live in a, a different way, in a better way, and look after the environment. I just don't feel like the leaders um, around the world for these big organisations and governments, uh, I think a lot of it's lip service. I think just recently, what was it? 400 private jets have landed um up in glasgow um and you know i think is it private jets are uh, like 50 percent of the cause 50 percent of the co2 uh, around the world so yet the blame gets put on to to other people like to, to i don't want to say for a better word but for the little people the ones who would just jump on a plane with 400 other people mm. yeah it feels to me that um they want everyone else to change but they're not necessarily going to change their actions like i think um supposedly they're all getting ferried about to and fro to the conferences but they're all in diesel or petrol cars mercedes vans you know you would think well if that's the case there would just be you know, there'd be hundreds of electric cars up there. There'd be Teslas, there'd be, you know, other electric cars that would be, you know, it'd be following through with with what they're potentially saying. So, um, and, you know, I look at um, Jeff Bezos comes on and he's like, supposedly started some $2 billion fund. Um, yeah, if you look, like, I think they shipped something like 4.2 billion cardboard packages in 2020 alone. And net this year, it's going to increase to about 5 billion that's trees that are getting, you know, get, getting chopped down for it. It feels like they still just want to grow um, in many ways. They're not saying to people to curb your um, consumerism um, in many mm. ways. It'd be good to get your take on, because obviously you're deeper in it and you have been for 20 years. Um, um, but yeah. Well, I mean, the whole capitalist society is all about consumerism, isn't it? People get rewarded and they get more, more money and thereby more power if they sell more. So we're constantly being brainwashed to consume more. Um, but, you know, whatever society you look into, there's always good things and bad things about it. And um, and so I think it's, it's about us stepping outside of that and seeing what's happening and saying no. And... And then, you know, using it for good producing, good consumables and and spreading the message like you're doing with your podcast, Rob, of, yeah, we're not, we're not happier just by consuming more. It's not true. It's an illusion. Um, you know, what is actually going to make us happy? And, you know, some consumables for sure, like, you know, good food is a good example. Um, it's going to make you happy because it, it nurtures you. But, you know, choose choose carefully and as we're looking already looking at uh, you know connection and I think for me once I made the jump to really go all the way with how can I impact the world in the most powerful way and making that jump which was you know scary for me I was a single parent I didn't know about you know my income wasn't certain 
But as soon as I did it, I was just like, felt so good, you know, and then step by step. Um, so I, I see the recognition that, yeah, making, making that step, step to do the right thing is not just going to be better for the benefit of the world, the people around you and the planet. It's also just going to make you feel so much better in yourself. Um, so, yeah, I think politicians <laughs> need to do it as well. <laughs> we yeah. all need to do it. But I think, you know, it doesn't help to go around um, and blame and, and criticise what other people are not doing. Uh, we need to just, you know, we can, or, you know, very much in the early environmental movement that I was part of, it was all about, it, there was a lot of um, blame and self-criticism, almost a bit masochistic. You know, it was very much about, oh, you know, we, we, we need to become vegan. And I thought that was really getting in the way of the change, the focus on that, because the world's not going to change. There's only about, I think it's only about 3% of people that were happy to make big sacrifice, personal sacrifices for the benefit of the planet. So we do need collective action. We need policy, policy shifts so that it becomes the easier um, solution or the better solution to adopt the sustainable behavior is partly what I'm trying to do with the company you know in a, a Brighton features house it's just a better house it doesn't just let you live a lot more sustainable it improves your life as well and same like Tesla is a good example it's it's an electric car but it's also just you know a, a better car it's a better car than the other car and happens to be electric so it's these solutions, I think, that we need, um, and that we can that we can build on, and you know, finding solutions. Doing like we are doing the podcast online now. Nobody has had any emissions traveling, and um, you know, it's just as good. So there's lots of there's lots of things we can do, but I think yeah, it is it is good also to speak up to ask that question. Like you know, they're having a COP six and, and seeing questioning the integrity of our politicians and voting in politicians that have integrity. Yeah, that's it. That's the way. I think it's going to take a little bit of a time, a bit of a shift. It feels like things are ramping up. It feels like things feeling more intense than ever with how things are shifting and changing. But that's then the opportunity for us to maybe get our act together to think, okay, let's get moving. And I love what you're doing because, you know, you're being the change and, if you just focus on, like say you put the news on and it says, I don't know, some wildfires somewhere or, you know, there's the, the rivers are overflowing and all these big, big volcanoes going off. For someone who's just sat there listening to it, it feels so disempowering because it's like, well, that's so big. It's mother nature. It's, um, yeah, when we can bring it back to ourselves, well, what can I do each day? Um, you know, and, and I'm interested to find out for you in terms of, because obviously you have a vision how do you get the balance right between having that vision that goal and actually taking kind of the action because sometimes I know from my own experience I can get lost talking about what I'm going to do the vision but then you just talk about it and you're not actually yeah. doing it as much as you need mm -hmm. to do it so if we get of someone who's been doing it for two decades like what's how, how have you mastered that well so I think it's important to get your vision right and that's not the easiest task. I mean, I think it took me until I was 35 that I knew what I wanted to do. And before that, I tried different things and I learned lots of things. And um, so, yeah, it's important to have a vision that is, you know, ambitious, but achievable. And that matches your passions and your strengths, gifts and talents. Uh, you know, and for some people, it might be in the environmental field, for some people it might be in the in the social field, um, or, you know, whatever, there's loads of things that we need in, in society. So, um, yeah, I would start with asking, what are my strengths, gifts and talents? Um, how can I use them to, and, my, and my passions? How can I use them to benefit the world? Um, and then think what that might be for you and I think for me a big thing was to just have a single pointed focus so um, you know I started with 10 things that I wanted to do 
in the world. And then I had an instruction, actually, you know, somebody said, well, people with many talents find it very hard to settle on something. So write down the 10 things you want to do in your life. I was about 30, I think, at this point. Um, and then just scr scrap the, take, take, take the top five. Uh, then scrap two, take the top three. And then do those three. Um, but I actually, for me, I just decided one would be my children and one would be the company and that would be Brighton Features. And so it's I, my impact has massively increased since I decided to focus on one thing. And all my other passions have sort of weaved themselves back in, but there was, there was a focus, which is really great. And the vision kind of keeps evolving, so I, I still question it and I always ask, you know, should it be... Uh, changed in any way is there something better I could be doing now um, but yeah and then there will be loads of reasons to avoid going for the vision because <laughs> because it's easier to talk about it isn't it you don't take up responsibility you don't face some massive hurdles um, so then it becomes more for you know I think we talked before a little bit about meditation practice about mindfulness and goal setting and um you know just learning to do the things um that you don't want to do as well i saw a quote which i thought was totally brilliant it said um successful people are the people who do the things that not so successful people avoid mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know it's not about I, I and i think it's so true you know everybody has some talents but it's not about the person who's most talented who's most successful in life is a person who's willing to do anything it takes to do the thing that they believe in. And so, you know, you want to be also kind to yourself and not too hard on yourself. So sometimes you have days when you just want to reflect and, and do nothing. And, and then it's just sometimes good to say, oh, I'm going to do this little thing today and try it out. And then it just becomes easier. I mean, now, actually, to be honest, I, don't, I, I have actually learned to enjoy anything I'm doing because in my role, I've sort of got to pick up the pieces when things go wrong. Um, so I've got to be willing to, to do anything. Um, and, and it becomes really nice when you actually develop that mindset, you know, that you even enjoy the cleaning of the house or, you know, <laughs> whatever it is that you, you never wanted to do. Yeah. That was amazing advice. Um, um, I'm really like, I was just like, yeah, that was, that was amazing. Particularly the 10 things. Cause I feel a bit at the moment, I'm at a bit of a phase in my life where I've got all these things I'm interested in, I think I'm passionate about, but I don't have the time for all of them. And I love that one of your top two is your children, because with me recently becoming a father, hundred percent, me being a, a parent is one of them. Like I will, engineer my life around them to 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 be there with them um so yeah it's getting the balance right with, with the with the other bits um how do you how do you face them because you say that quote was brilliant about people um people who do stuff uh, just because you do it that's how you're successful um how do you face then challenges how do you you know when you because i understand there must have been some big ones that have come up with water lilies over the past few years because mm. there will be times when it can cause a lot of stress sleepless nights um like really question maybe the reason for doing stuff um how, how do you find a way through them challenges um well when they happen you just have to get on with it and when you have a big project and, you know, staff and customers and contractors depending on you, there's nothing else to do but find the solution. If you haven't really started a project, you can probably hide and run away still. But um, so, you know, part of it is, you know, throwing yourself into a big project. And I think the level of the size and the level of risk that people want to take on, everybody's got a different propensity um, to risk. You know, pe some people like a sort of more exciting life. Some people like more calm. And, and so it's it's different for everyone. Um, but, yeah, you work through it. And, 
I think you have to focus on nurturing yourself as well. Um, you have to learn to relax whilst you're really stressed so that you can make good decisions. It's been massively important to build a good team for us so we can really shoulder each other and, you know, and, and take over when somebody gets, gets ill or it gets too much. And so that's been an incredible learning. When it got to a point where actually I was like, I actually cannot deliver this anymore on my own, you know, and then I had to develop a lot of humility and relying on other people. And I really learned how to work with people in that and how to work with the right people, you know, the people I could rely on. And we have now, interestingly, we are a property company, but we are run by all, by all women um, because really the people who stayed um, and who were the ones that were, they happened to be, happened to be women. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really amazing to know that there's so much support between us and we're always sticking out for each other. And, and you know, it's more, you've got to be careful that no one overworks. Um, it's not a worry for me that people don't do the work. It's more of a worry that they do too much. But we are very much in touch with each other to know what's going on and to support each other. And that's kind of happened um, you know, organically uh, by the uprising of the people in the team. Yeah, brilliant. I think when we spoke a few weeks ago, we were talking about how, um, and this is where you've got to keep your ego in check because you, it, the best thing you can do is employ people who are better at things than you. Yeah, you look at lots of things in big organizations, the bosses don't want to employ people underneath them who are better than them because they become fearful that they're going to steal the job. So you end up giving it to someone else, but then that just has a detrimental effect to the actual, what you're attempting to do. So if you can bring people on and, you know, and you know, put your ego in check and be like, well, this is for the betterment of, it's going to help me as well, but it's also the right thing for the projects. So yeah. for anyone who is um, listening to this now, I understand that Water Lilies is fully subscribed. Um, there's none left. Um so in case anyone's thinking they wanted to hop hop on the on the bus to Bristol and, and move in, what um have you got any other projects in the pipeline um that you're looking to to do so people can kind of keep an ear to the ground and stay tuned to that? Yeah, we're lining projects up now, and the best thing is to go on the Bright Green Futures website, so brightgreenfutures.co.uk, and you will see at the top it says register your interest. Um, register your interest because then you're on our mailing list in the questionnaire to ask you basically what you're looking for it or that which then means when we're looking for land we are also trying to um, look for plots that are that do what people want so we can directly consider your opinion and then once we've got um an, a new offering and a new project we will get in touch with everyone who's on the list um yeah people can also register for a tour so um, we didn't haven't done any tours throughout the pandemic but we're planning to do them again so that is another opportunity then to to come to Bristol and and meet us and ask questions sounds good well I'll, I'll be sure to include all the links and stuff well I think um I could carry on chatting away but I think we've kind of covered all the bits that I've really looking forward to and um yeah you've not disappointed and there's plenty of times in that where I've got excited about my own future and how that's going to unfold so I really appreciate you Steffi for taking the time today to um to share your story and everything you're doing with uh, Brighter Green Futures. Well it'd be lovely to build a community with you Rob I hope we can make that happen. <laughs> There we have it. Another episode wrapped up. I hope you enjoyed that as much as me. You can check out Brighter Green Futures and everything Steffi's doing over on their site. I'll include a link to that as well. It's a pleasure to be able to sit down with these kinds of people and talk about interesting things. And I'm really grateful that other people find these things interesting as well. I think at this moment in time, there's a real thirst for wanting to live in a different way. I feel like we've gone so far off course the past hundreds of years how many de certainly decades at least maybe 100 150 we'll see with the way we live and i think there's a better world there's a brighter world as as it says with brighter green futures 
And if we can be part of this solution and be part of coming together and living, living like more back to our roots, that's something that really resonates with me is like living back, getting in tune with our roots. And I think I'm definitely moving to this way, this, this way. And when it's going to happen, I don't know. I'm going to just let that one go and just, as Michael Singer would say, you know, surrender, um, to surrender to life. So if it's meant to be, it's meant to be, but I know it's something I'm excited about. Anyway, that's just me jabbling on about my own future ambitions to live as part of a community. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, leave a review. That would be amazing. And um, yes, share this episode with a friend. If you think someone who might be down in the Southwest who would like to um, find out more about what Steffi's doing in Bristol or just anyone who you think would be open to finding out a little bit more about living community and what it's like, then please share this episode. So anyway, until next time, have a good one.